<laughs> all right, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you all here. Glad to see you. Um, if you don't, I've got one extra copy. Oh, don't take that one yet. Sorry. You can take that one. <laughs> um, we're just going to finish this one. It's not going to be great. I got the number for everybody for the next one. So we're just going to wrap up Lesson 7 of the Book of Hebrews. And uh, we're looking at uh, Chapter 8. So if you want to jump into Chapter 8 in your Bibles. And um, I know we got one person watching online. Hello, so welcome. Um, the link below should get you to the Bible study, and there's a chat window there if you want to jump in and let me know if there's any issues or anything like that. I'll do my best to fix them. So welcome. Anything on our minds that we'd like to pray about today before we begin? Thanks for Margie's surgery. Yes, yeah, Margie Macon's foot surgery went successfully, so we'll keep that in our, our prayers. So we're going to pray about that in church as well. So if you're a first service. Uh, it was Caleb's birthday on the 8th. Oh, Caleb's okay, birthday. Um, little marker. Oh, this is golden birthday. Oh, the golden birthday. Even better. Okay. Very good. Well, let's start with prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for the promises you've given to us. We ask you to open our hearts and minds today as we hear and study your word. Bless our discussions and the applications that we're able to make. Uh, Lord, we also offer thanks for a su successful surgery for Margie Macon and her foot. Help that to continue to heal up well and that uh, everything uh, uh, recovers just right for her. And uh, I thank you for watching over her during that surgery. And Lord, uh, we give you thanks uh, for the years of life that you've given to Caleb and just ask that as you continue to watch over him and protect him, you would continue to grow his faith and his love for you and for other people. Bless us today and always, Lord. Amen. All right, so we ended oh, a few weeks ago here and already. I got really worked the kinks out of the system here. That's okay. Um, if you see me staring at this, it's just because I'm looking to see if anybody's dropped a note in. So you're in this e-learning environment. Your brain is always kind of in two places. And if any of you are familiar with teaching and doing stuff online and teaching in person, you kind of know what I mean there. So you're kind of in two different spots. So we were looking at two um, different covenants. I'm going to see if you grab that And I think that might be just a good place to start our review. Um, so we got the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Testament or the New Covenant. That's how we get our, our names for those two parts of the Bible. <coughs> and that Sinaitic covenant was the one that the Lord had made with the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And it was different from the promise of an offspring who would come from the line of Adam and then ultimately Seth and on down um, because it involved all of the civil and the ceremonial laws and the moral laws that God wanted the Israelites to follow. Remember, the Israelites were coming off of a roughly 400-year slavery in Egypt where there was no like active prophecy, at least as far as we're aware. Right? They had, they had all their history up to the slavery, and then after that it was, you know, they were on their own, so to speak. Uh, no active prophecy, no active revelation occurred until Moses came, and then he became their prophet, and through him, the Lord kind of taught the Israelites what it meant to follow the true God um, instead of these pagan gods, 
that they had kind of sort of gotten used to after their 400 years in Egypt. And so the, the laws that God laid down, that's why they sound so different from the new covenant, which is all about promises, the Mosaic or the Sinaitic covenant is heavy on do this, don't do that, because God's trying to achieve a couple of different goals. One, to educate them, get their minds wrapped around what it means to be devoted to him and him alone. And two, through the unrelenting demands of that law, point them ultimately to their need of a savior from their sins, which would come in, in their system, the Sinaitic system, through sacrifices that were repeated over and over and over again, pointing them ahead to the one great sacrifice that was to come. So that's kind of the, the uh, background there on where we were. And uh, the writer of Hebrews, remember his audience? Who is, who is the audience that the writer of Hebrews is, is talking to here? And I remember his audience. It's different from the other letters because you've got specific cities or churches. This one isn't written to a specific place so much as a group of people. Yeah, remember? Educated, scripturally educated Jews. Yeah, so you've got this group of, of Jewish people, right? And uh, they know their laws, they know the Mosaic Law. And they were going through some tough times, some persecutions. And so what was the temptation? Well, Judaism was a legal religion, an accepted religion. Um, certainly among the Jewish people that hadn't received Jesus as their Savior, they rejected him. So they're not going to give you a hard time. So if you act and look like an Old Testament Jew, they're going to leave you alone. Things are going to go better for you because it's just better, right? But um, that's not good because you give up then on the New Testament or the New Covenant, which is um, far superior to the Old Covenant because the Old Covenant could never achieve its ultimate purpose, which was um, that, that freedom, that, that love of God, that absolute devotion to God and his word, and the life of repentance, all these things that we talk about so easily today. It could never accomplish that because it was built on law, not on gospel. It pointed to the gospel. That's why the New Testament had to come. Right? That's why the writer here is being so... Um, powerfully about, you know, pointing them to that New Testament. They've got to have that new covenant because that's the thing that's going to save them. They give up on that, they give up on salvation. Okay, so let's, uh, I don't, did we get to that list four ways, the new covenant? Did anybody have anything scribbled in there at the bottom? All right, let's pick it up there then. Um, so let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. <laughs> Pull our Bibles out. Anybody need a Bible? I got six. Throw them. Can I take one and let you distribute? Yeah. Fill me up. I'm sorry. I heard that. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 8. All right. Yeah, we got to get these new guys broken in here. Get some coffee spilled on them, you know, all the, all the marks of a Bible study. Bible. Yeah, don't, don't, don't you have to spill it. It's got to be a, a legitimate, accidental spill. You, if you purposefully spill the coffee on it, I have to throw the Bible out. That's just the rule. <laughs> That's in there in a footnote, by the way. Did you know that? <laughs> okay, Hebrews chapter uh, 8, and we're looking at verse 9. Somebody want to just read verse 9 to the group here? Hebrews 8, verse 9. Yeah, well, thanks, sir. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their forefathers at the time when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they did not remember my covenants, I ignored them, says the Lord. All right. So, uh, verse 9 gives the reason why the old covenant was being replaced. Write that reason down here in the blank. Can you find it in there? Write it down. Kind of towards the end of verse 9 there. 
I'm not looking for one word here. What is the reason of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant being deficient? They didn't remember it. They didn't remember it. They didn't remember it. Yeah. Didn't remember it. All right. List four ways the new covenant will fix the deficiency of the old. And you can just kind of scan through those verses there. Hey, guys. I'll tuck you in here. You're good. I'll just make Gary stand outside. <laughs> So, yeah, go ahead and uh, talk about with your table, your neighbor. Four reasons, four ways the new covenant will fix the deficiency of the old. And we'll come back together here. And you're looking at verses uh, 8 through 12. Feeling. Okay? Did you guys come up with a different one here at your table? 
merciful. All right. So the so mercy will be a central theme of this new covenant. All right. Mr. Lucan's tale, did you guys come up with anything interesting? Everyone will know it. Everyone will know it. Did you guys come up with anything else? Because everybody knows there's no longer reason to teach people. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Um, no need to teach. Hmm. That's fascinating. All right. Now we, I asked her for. Um, did you guys come up with anything different here at your table? Anything interesting? Yeah, another one? Okay, yeah, so we'll, we'll just kind of attach that guy to mercy, right? For I'll remember their sins no more. Yeah. As sort of the, uh, um, if you get to the end of the book of, um, I'm thinking, is it Deuteronomy or is it Leviticus? But one of the, one of the, when you study kind of ancient um, contracts in, in the times of, of when the Sinaitic Covenant was developed, usually a contract with, would end with, this is the good stuff that's going to happen to you if you keep the, this promise. This is the bad stuff that's going to happen to you if you don't. And God kind of follows that same pattern. And you get a lot of... Uh, you know, here's all the blessings that I will pour out onto you. Your crops will never fail. Your enemies will stay away. You'll be prop, you'll be peaceful, prosperous nation. You'll live there forever. If you don't, the land will vomit you out. You know, he uses that very graphic picture. Your enemies are going to come in. You'll be cast to the nations. All these threats, 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 threats. Whereas um, the new covenant is characterized by mercy. It wasn't that, I, I don't think it's fair to say the Old Covenant had no mercy in it, right? That would be, I think, very unfair as you read through it, right? Especially when you get to the ceremonial portion, it's all about dealing with mankind's problem of sin, right? And how do we, how do we work through these issues together in the sacrificial system? Okay, if you uh, flip over then, to the next last page of this as we wrap up this lesson here. These four ways here that we came up with, and maybe you came up with uh, slightly different ones, seem to imply certain problems that uh, people were having with the Old Covenant. All right, so if you look at these, what I'm saying is there's kind of a corresponding negative attached to each one, sort of. So, um, discuss what those problems might be with your neighbor, and um, some of the some of the problems, right? Discuss some of the problems with your neighbor, and why were they having so much trouble? So let's let's just let you guys talk about this first. So, mind, heart, mercy. Everyone will know it. No need to teach it. What does that imply? What kind of problem they're having? Not being able to worship God. They were exposed to idols. Hopefully you guys can see a little bit here. We'll bring you up a little closer.
in their hearts. What, what problem might they have been having trying to keep this old covenant if God says, look, i got to get this into your mind and into your heart? What might that be implying here? Anybody? Yeah? They have memory problems. They have memory problems, okay. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Not a priority. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Not a priority, right? Not in my mind, not in my heart. What would make, or what perception of God's law would make it not a priority in their life? Got a thought there? Well, we were talking about how the knowledge of God could be passed down, but they had no way of worshiping God. They couldn't sacrifice, they couldn't do any of the physical things. Oh, I see, okay. God. Sure. So, so they just had a knowledge passed down, but no way of actively <clears throat> worshiping. Okay, so you're talking about that time before the Sinaitic Covenant was given, right? When they're in Egypt and... Right, a slave. Right, they didn't so have a form. A generation of people that didn't worship God. Okay, yeah, okay. What about after? Now God, so let's say now God's given his law, right? They know it. What's, what does this imply if, it's not, if that law isn't in their mind or heart? Why, why isn't it a priority then? Well, let me ask it this way. When is it easiest for us as Christians to keep the Ten Commandments? When we're in the Word all the time. Okay, so, okay. And, and what's the Word going to inspire us with? To do God's will. Okay. Why would we ever want to do God's will? There you go. Okay, right? So it kind of gets to priority, right? Uh, I'm not priority. Motivation. I said I saw priority up there, right? If God's law isn't a priority for me, right, in my Christian life, maybe it's because the motivation, the foundation has fallen away, right? And so um, these words that the writer of Hebrews is quoting comes from Jeremiah. So Jeremiah's Remember his nickname? The weeping prophet? Right? Jeremiah's the weeping prophet because he witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. So he saw his brother Israelites get carried off into exile because this was not a priority. It, it wasn't that they weren't carrying on the sacrifices. It wasn't that they weren't following the rituals. What was missing? 
Yeah, basically faith, right? Yeah, the whole underlying foundation of trust was God. And, and pagan worship definitely came into that. But in addition to that, it was ultimately a lack of love. So, so if it's going to be in their heart and in their mind, um, there's got to be a, a different emphasis. And that's where this comes in. So now, um, so God makes it a point to talk about this new covenant as I will remember their sins no more. Right, I'm going to show you mercy now. So what does that imply, what mistake does that imply they were making about the Old Covenant? Did they never quite reach the goal? Or? Never quite reach the goal? Okay, maybe. Randy? Uh, thinking they had to keep atoning for their sins. You know, they didn't. Okay, so, so it was on them, right? That there could be no mercy under God's covenant system that it depended upon them. And I, I, I think that you know you got all kinds of variety of, of how that might look in an individual's life. But if, if, if you're not seeing the mercy of God in the great day of atonement, if you're not seeing that, you're missing out, right? And so something happened, right, to make that ritual just a ritual, right, and, and lose its spiritual significance to them. So again, um, we're going to kind of see some common themes through this, but um, yeah, so you know, they, they missed the, the mercy, they missed this in the Old Covenant because they viewed it as just obedience, right? This I have to do this. We have to go to these festivals in Jerusalem. I have to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> We're going to see a lot of parallels here between that and our own lives, aren't we? Okay? Everyone will know it. Everyone will know it. This one's kind of fascinating to me, actually. Especially when you couple it with number four. You don't need to teach it. Everyone will know it. So obviously that implies nobody knew it, right? But they're carrying on. They're carrying on the work, right? So they knew it, right? Or did they? Or did they? Yeah. What? Tell me more. Oh. It was just like an idea. I'm trying to verbalize it now. Um, when you're just going through the motions, yeah, you're not. Kind of the difference between knowledge and wisdom. You know, you, you can, anyone can know something. I already saw you. Know, it's always cute as a class like the math problems. Any monkey can figure that out. But, <laughs> but knowing how to use it, right? The wisdom to be like, oh, okay, that's that's a lot harder to actually understand, master something. It's sure. Different than just knowing it. Yeah, applying something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I can go. And this was this was a big criticism that the prophet Isaiah had against them too. So and Isaiah was many many years before this. And one of his famous quotes is, you people, you say, the temple, the temple, the temple, right? Like, this is magic luck charm. As long as we got the temple, you know, God must still love us, right? We still got the temple. In some ways, the northern kingdom, which had no temple, in fact, had two idols, in some ways, they were a little bit more faithful because at least they were still calling on the name of the Lord. <laughs> it wasn't good what was happening up there. Trust me, King Ahab made sure that that any vestiges of the old covenant were, were as far removed from their culture as possible. But um, at least there was this kind of idea that we need to worship God, not just go through empty rituals. But it all boiled down to the same thing, right? They were carried off into exile for the same reason, right? They, they lacked that faith. Um, what about this one? There'll be no need to teach it. That's really interesting. No, Never again will a man teach his fellow citizen or his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. Could that be referencing that it's going to be outside of Israel? Like it's going to be to more than just one nation? Okay, so I, I think there's, I, I think that's part of it, right? You've got this Old Testament evangelism was all come to the temple and see, 
we are the promised people, come and we'll tell you, right? Come here. Right? Whereas New Testament evangelism is going out, right, with the gospel, spreading that message. So both, by the way, are effective methodologies for evangelism. It's not like one is worse than the other, but that's just how it was done. Yeah, so I think that's part of it, right? right you don't have to um, bring people in to the culture of the of the message of God, you can spread that out. And um, what's I mean, if you think about the main difference between a system of rigid laws and the message of the gospel, what's the big difference between those <clears throat> two systems? Maybe I'll, maybe okay. right, yeah, right. I think you can go to anybody on the street, can't you? And say, God is love. Do you agree with that? And I think probably 90 to 95% of the people are going to say, yeah, God, God is a God of love. Right? You have to teach them that. They know it. How do they know that? How do they know that God should be a God of love? Where does that come from? Right? You've got, you've got that conscience within us that knows that if God is truly God, he must somehow be good, right? There must be a greater good somewhere. So, um, so I think that's part of what's getting at here, too. There's no need to, to have to teach. You can go out and you can share the message, and it's going to resonate with a certain part of that individual. Whereas the Old Testament, the Sinaitic Covenant, you really had to know that, right? If you're going to be a priest, you can just walk into the temple and start being a priest. Right? You had to know the rituals. You had to know all the stipulations. You had to know the religious calendar. Um, by the way, so we're in the season of Lent. Which uh, chapter of the Bible teaches us about the season of Lent, that we're supposed to have the season of Lent? I'm glad you're struggling with this. Because... The trick question. <laughs> Pastor Gekka just about fell out of his chair. <laughs> Pastor Wilcox, come on, don't teach him that. <laughs> right, it's a human tradition, right? We're free. We're free to worship in these things, right? There's no hard set pattern of worship. There was if you were an Israelite. But you had to know that, right? You had all kinds of calendars. You think trying to keep the church calendar and the calendar calendar straight is a problem. Try to keep the the lunar calendar and the festival calendar and the harvest calendar and all the other crazy calendars that they had and the new moon, all that stuff, they had to keep all that straight, right? So, um, so there's no need to teach. So what does this imply though was happening in in their lives? What What wasn't being taught? Again, we're seeing kind of a common theme here. They had the rituals down, right? Mercy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So. Christ. Yeah. Mercy. Motivation. Yeah. What did King David say? Um, burnt offerings and sacrifice you do not desire, but what? Mercy. But mercy, right? A, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. And that was a man who lived under the old covenant, right? So it wasn't that it was hidden away in a field that nobody could find it. It was there, but if you weren't listening, you weren't going to find it, right? So, so it's not on God, as if God had made this so impossible that nobody could discover it. It was absolutely there. Um, what was pro the problem is there was no faith. When the Apostle Paul was describing the Israelites, is it him? Now I'm thinking it might have been Hebrews. But anyway, they, they didn't combine, the, the scriptures say, they didn't combine with uh, what God said with faith. In other words, you know, they didn't have that trust. They didn't have that love of God. So, um, so this kind of situation in the hearts of people sets the stage for a new way of doing things. And that's where we wind up here on our worksheet here. All right. So how does forgiveness form the foundation of having God's law in heart and mind? 
How does forgiveness form the foundation of having God's law in heart and mind? Debbie said earlier, right? Here's what he's done for me, right? Why I serve. Knowing that it doesn't rest on your shoulders. Yeah. It's not on me. Right? Well, like you, like you preached about in the sermon today, the victory. So you, there's a victory there. That's already, that you know the battle's already won, which I guess gives you this sliver of hope that, okay, <laughs> I'm motivated by what you've done for me and it's already won, maybe I can, through God's help, to keep this temptation or whatever. Well. What, what is more important in your household? That your kids follow all the rules, or that they know that even if they violate one of those rules, they're not going to lose your love? That's the second one. Right? Obviously. Right? You got the most obedient kids in the world, but if they hate your guts, what's the point? Right? What's the point? Right? This is why Paul had to say, don't embitter your children. Right? Right? And and we all parent under forgiveness. Okay, so this isn't like meant to give anybody guilt here, because we, we all we all do this from the, the sphere of forgiveness and and we know that we too serve in the hope of our own forgiveness as parents. But, but just think about that, right? You know, is God worried so much about obedience, or is he worried so much about where your heart is at with him, right? Now, obedience matters. Oh, of course it does. But it's got to flow from this. Right? It's got to flow from forgiveness. Without that foundation of forgiveness, then what is the point? It doesn't matter. Alright. Uh, last question here. How does that make serving God quote unquote easier? Maybe going back to something you said earlier. You want to expand on that a little? Uh, well, I was just thinking uh, we love because he first loved us. Yeah. Uh, and that forgiveness shows that. Yeah, so it's a, uh, it's, you know, it's the energy that God gives to us. His love is that energy that He gives and that kicks us out then to go and do that, right? Yeah. So, so free love in the in the good sense of free love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on here, wait a second. <laughs> Sorry. Going back to the 60s here. Sorry about that. Love without cost. Sorry about that. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's not even a great way of putting it because it costs a whole lot, right? It costs the life of Jesus. But but my love, right, it, it doesn't depend on me, right? It flows from love. It flows from the love of Christ. All right. What else can we say about this? What else can we say? It exists outside of us in a way, and I think it's a song like God's mercies new every morning. So like, it's it's there every day outside of you. It doesn't depend on you. So knowing that, believing in that, gives you like the greatest joy, I guess, because you don't have to look at you. But then when you do look at you, you're like, well, it's a totally different <coughs> versus like that. Person you don't know, Christ has done it for him. Got all this weight on me, and I, yeah. you know, and they might, he might go self righteous or despair, right? But we have neither. Yeah, we get to we get to chart that course down the middle, right? Which is, um, you know, hope, freedom, peace, confidence, right? Um, and and not have to worry about an angry father at the end of the day or facing a judge at the end of our time on earth, we know that that forgiveness he gives to us 
new every morning. We need that. We need that renewal. I was reading, uh, rereading an interesting sci-fi series that I read when I was a kid. But ah, I get this to my kids, see if they like it. They seem to be enjoying it. But one of the themes in it is uh, is war and how mankind is always fighting each other in war. But then this alien species comes and controls the minds of every human being to make them loyal to their alien overlords. And for the most part, if you're looking at this society and you didn't know that there were these aliens controlling everybody, you would see a very peaceful, agrarian society. No war, prosperity, generally speaking, little crime. And you look at it and you go, this looks like a nice place, but they're all slaves to these aliens. And the, 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 the trilogy ends with o they're overthrowing their alien overlords, and immediately they go right back to bickering with each other. <laughs> right? It's kind of a sad ending to it. There's little glimmers of hope, of course, but, but the author is really making this really interesting point of the human condition, right? That we really are dependent upon a higher power to make us good. Right? And I don't know that he's trying to weave God into this at all, but it's certainly heavily implied that left to our own devices, we're just going to make a mess of things. We need something, some higher power, to give us that ability to, um, to have true love with one another. And, and even the protagonist throughout the series kind of struggles at times with that. Like, should I even be fighting this war? I mean, look at these people I'm hanging out with. He, he's not controlled by them, but the other people are. And he looks at them and he goes, these are really nice people. I'd like to live with these people. These are good people. They love, they, they get along with each other. You know, what would be so wrong about living that way? It really gives you some, some things to think about. And I think kind of illustrates why the human spirit needs a better covenant, right? Okay. We wrap it up here. Let me make sure I got the last one answered here. All right, knowing that the new covenant is built on better promises, what could you change in your life to reflect this? So just give you 30 seconds to think about that, and then we'll dip our toes into the next chapter. What could you change in your life to better reflect that covenant? Just on your own, thinking about this. Hey, it's been a while since I've almost run out of copies. That's a good sign. That's a great sign. All right, let's uh, transition here real quick. I know it's kind of grinding gears to do that, but that's all right. Can you find the grinder? So as we're looking at our letter to Hebrews here, um, again, the front cover there just kind of gives you that general overlay of the whole section of Hebrews and we're here in the middle of uh, kind of towards the bottom I guess more towards the bottom than the middle towards the left hand or the right hand side there sections uh, chapters 8 through 10 sacrifice and covenant that's kind of what we're talking about right now um, there's a lot of Old Testament coming in now we just had that big section from Jeremiah 31 a few seconds ago and um, just remember, you like that guy pulling the collar away there? Uh, points feel a bit uncomfortable, but not afraid. And what he's trying to do here is just challenge us. Challenge us in our 
Christian faith challenge us in our Christian piety um, to really get us relying on God and His promises. All right, introduction time. I recently asked the catechism class why a shell was used to picture baptism. It was good I did that because there were a lot of nice sounding answers, but none of them were right. Symbols lose value if they're not explained. So in this lesson we'll see that same phenomenon and with even greater spiritual significance. All right, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, 1 to 10, the earthly tent. All right, would somebody like to read verses 1 through 5 of Hebrews chapter 9? 1 through 5. Thanks, sir. The first covenant had regulations for worship and for an earthly sanctuary. The first room of the tent, of the tent was furnished with a lampstand, a table, bread, and a presence. This room was called the holy place. And behind the, sec the second curtain was the room of the tent called the most holy place. It had a golden censer for our incense and the ark of the covenant, which was covered with iron gold. Inside the ark was a golden jar holding manna, Aaron's staff, that had its bright buds, and stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark, a glorious cherubim overshadowed the atonement seat. We are not going to talk about these things in detail now. Okay, <laughs> that's enough. It says. You guys know what I'm talking about, basically, what I say up there. <laughs> All right, six through eight. Somebody want to grab those verses? Six through eight. Bill, thanks. <clears throat> After these things had been furnished in this way, the priest would always enter the first room of the tent to perform their ministry. But only the high priest would enter the second section of the tent once each year, and not without blood, which he offered for himself before the sins of the people for the sins that people committed in ignorance. By this the Holy Spirit indicated that while the first room of the tent existed, a way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed. Hmm, that's interesting. Alright, nine and ten. So I'm read those verses there. Nine and ten. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. This tent is a picture pointing to the present time. Since it is only a picture, the gifts and sacrifices that are brought there are not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They were only bodily regulations about foods, drinks, and various washings, which were enforced until the time of the new order. All right. Let's turn our attention to our worksheet here. In these first ten verses, the writer is discussing the tabernacle, or called the tent of meeting. That's why he's using the word tent here. If you are familiar with the NIV, I think they settle on tabernacle in their version, in their editing, which is fine. Either way, talking about that, but the word tent is the actual word in Greek, skene. Why couldn't the conscience be cleared by the tabernacle, or the temple, itself? Notice in verse 9, he says, they are not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Why is that? Okay, it required a sacrifice, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're talking about symbols here, right? Pictures, and pictures that are going to lead to something, for sure. But the symbol in and of itself isn't going to do them a bit of good unless there's a sacrifice that goes along with it, right? And that's kind of the second question there. How could this be since God gave this to them? So what's the point then? If we know that the, sac the symbol itself doesn't contain the power, what's going on here then? Why well, go through all this rigmarole? I see an idea floating sure. there. Preparing for the one that will be. Okay, so this is all teaching. Teaching, 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 teaching. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, if you want to talk with your neighbor just on your own, make a list of three non-religious symbols or icons that once stood for something but have lost their meaning. All right? A list of three symbols or icons that once stood for something but have now kind of lost their meaning. Anything you want. Not religious. Not religious. <laughs> symbolize right that unity and you're one and all that stuff and now eh, we just get rings for everything okay interesting okay any others ready the rainbow oh yeah what are you getting at there okay right so isn't that interesting how that has worked out you know God sets this bow in the sky to remind us about his mercy and man has corrupted that. I find that just fascinating. Yeah, I think you guys were talking a little bit about that too. How you in your classroom you try to use that in a good way, a positive way, in a godly way, so that they kind of have that other point of view, right? Yeah, boy, our, we got to do a lot of work to help our our kiddos not get too confused by the culture we live in, don't we? Give them a lot to think about. We really got to work on that. Okay, another one more symbol that's lost its meaning. Oh, pick up. Yeah. I'd say the cross. Oh, okay. Oh, we weren't supposed to use religious symbols, but I'll give oh, you a pass okay. because you're Sorry religious. About that. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that. True. But it is true, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean how many rappers are wearing these crosses and they're just the most profane things <laughs> What is going on? Yeah. We mentioned that our table the statue of liberty. Where it doesn't have the same meaning for the immigration. Okay. Interesting. Statue of Liberty. Okay. All right. So now, is it the symbol's fault? What's happened? Why? Let's go to the Statue of Liberty. Why is it that the Statue of Liberty isn't portraying that same kind of melting pot experience that it once did? Why have we lost that? Well, I don't want to get too political here or anything, but, you know, give me your thoughts. Because we're reverting into tribalism. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we're reverting to tribalism. We were talking about the senior religion class the other day. That was an interesting conversation. Yeah, everybody's in their factions, right? We don't want to tolerate, right, that kind of idea of 
I, I can I can go along with your viewpoint to this point, but now I'm going to disagree with you. But that doesn't mean we can't be neighbors. Yeah. What are you going to say, right? Well, a symbol is put on. Media symbol is put on by the culture that you're living at the time. So as your culture changes, your symbols and meanings are going to change. Okay. So there's that too, right? And depending on what that change is, it can be positive, it can be negative, whatever. But um, at the same time, um, it can be a reminder of what once was, right? You think about all the. What's the school in uh, Tacoma that's getting renamed? Um, Wilson. Yeah, Wilson. Yeah, I know, I don't know. I read the article today. I don't want to get too political here, but it was interesting reading the article and its point of view on that missionary, you know, forcing these Indians to learn about Jesus, all that stuff. Also relative to circumstance. Also relative to circumstance. Yeah. I think we don't necessarily, we in our generation, our group's generation, don't understand what it's like to immigrate and don't appreciate the sacrifice and the struggle. And I think for those of us that have the luxury of living in America for so long, maybe we don't celebrate that struggle yeah. the way that the Statue of Liberty celebrated that for so many people. Sure. Okay, good. Yeah, so, so what we're kind of getting at here um, is that Whatever underlies a symbol has to be taught, doesn't it? It has to be taught. You were talking about culture. It has to be part of the culture. Um, maybe in just a few moments we can talk quickly about this, because I think this might be an interesting discussion. And we can come back to it uh, next week. Uh, no, we won't. Next week we have the voters meet, so the week after. Discuss some Lutheran or Christian symbols that might have, that might have or might be at risk of losing their value. So we mentioned the cross earlier. But uh, Lutheran or Christian symbols that might have or might be at risk of losing their value. Any any at risk in your your mindset? Yeah. Well, you know, the dove symbolizing the Holy Spirit or symbolizing peace. Um, it now symbolizes soul. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I put a bird up in the Catholic Church because that's what it was. Oh, sure. Yeah, Twitter has taken over that bird picture. Yeah. And were you trying to portray the Holy Spirit? Uh, yeah. 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 Y
does our liturgy need to maybe, you know, we've talked about how do we make worship a little bit more accessible to people that are that are very unfamiliar with it. That's that's a really, really good thing. Okay, so we'll pick that up there next time. So think about that maybe over this course of the next week. Any Maybe when you come to church today, if you haven't already, um, think about the symbols you see around you. How many of those have meaning? How many of those have maybe kind of gotten washed into the, the background a little bit? All right. Kiddos are back. Why don't we close with a... Um, Let's see, we haven't sung in a while, so let's uh, close with uh, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father.